Cool. So, uh, my name is Jerry Anthony Witt. Sometimes things just come out poetry, sometimes I don't, but, you know, either way, this is actually a poem I wrote, or uh, a process I did, or a piece of art from my heart, or uh, it came from my mind and my wit. My last name's actually Witt, like W-I-T-T, but uh, I don't know, we can even go J-A-H, Hernandez's mother's written name, or we can go Witt. You can see it with your jaw, or you can see it with mine. You can see it twice out of each, both eyes. You can hear it twice too, so you can home ride it. So you can, you know, Doppler effects. So you can, well, how you know where you is. I mean, our ears work the same way as an owl's or bats do. But, uh, you know, if it sounds like it's getting further away, then the uh, Doppler effect is the waves are getting, you know, thinner as it goes further away from you. Um, and that's just that, you know. Um, so, I designed a clean energy process. Well, actually, October 18th, 2008, um, I was reading a book on Einstein, and I just saw something, and basically it has to do with the Doppler effect. You know, it took two billion years, so I hear, for atoms to even the molecules, although there was still radio frequencies, you know, for thoughts to keep on traveling to you. I mean, you don't always hear with your ears. Sometimes you hear with your mind instead. Sometimes you're on the same wavelength as somebody else, even though it's, well, probably got to them, like in a magnetic way, but electromagnetism is, well, that's the reality. Um, you know, and whenever I just kind of doing my thing, then, you know, at the edge of dimensional, yeah, right there at the limit you know, wave and particle and here and there in multiple places all at the same time, you know. But I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, string theory it in. Actually, I'm just getting there the simple way. That's why I defined it. So, actually, uh, Stephen Hawking, he had said something in his book. He explained that the math for string theory was so far off the first time that he went ahead and fit the math to the theory, which he explained is not proper scientific method. Now, when Albert Einstein was three and his sister come home from hospital first day, he looked over and said, where are the wheels? Now, this is kind of a trip because uh, I see the wheels I see the S on his chest, I see the man of steel, and the technology that brought that dude back from, you know, the inception that he just went into, you know. Like, uh, before he went, he said God is dead, and man had to, you know, human, humans, the folk that just said, screw it, let's go do it, let's go get him, and, uh, well, they proved it. And the technology on Stephen Hawking alone is worth seven trillion, I heard. It was on, you know, one of my, uh, I don't know, one of my news channels that comes through my phone. I don't know if it was fake news or real news, but I do know fake means, you know, uh, manipulated or untrue or what else does it mean? Um, false. Um, corrupted. Um, what else does fake mean? Not true. As simple as that. You know? So, if I was sitting there saying fake news about something that was real and I wanted you to believe it was fake news, all I'd have to say is fake news and I'd be like corrupting the news to get you to see it through the view I want you to have it as. But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, uh, let's get to the simple truth. So, Stephen Hawking, you know, he explained that the math was not correct. It was so far off that he was 
said he was too embarrassed to say. And he went ahead and fit the math to the theory, which is not proper scientific method. Now, Albert Einstein, you know, he worked at the patent office, not when he was three years old, whenever he asked where the wheels are. Um, you know, in the book that I, that quote was from, they explained that he must have, you know, they tried to explain it away saying that Albert Einstein must have thought his sister was a toy or something. But in actuality, she was his best friend. Um, let's see. So, if we, we've already introduced, I mean, they already know each other in a crazy kind of way. Um, and actually, Stephen Hawking's last words were a quote of my own. There is a greater intelligence to the universe. That was part of a definition for gravity I wrote. Um, basically, the definition for gravity is simple. Gravity is the singularity still connected. If the singularity were canceled, well then, what are we doing here? I mean, I am here, so therefore it's not canceled. All is connected through gravity, therefore it's still connected. Um, so gravity is the singularity, very simply. Now, I took the idea to the head of physics at Fresno State. I took a few ideas there. Um, now, you'll notice, clear and simply, there is no head of physics at Fresno State. There is a hall sitting chair. And I know I'm talking a little trash, but it looks more like, you know, some entrails where a guy used to sit and, I don't know, maybe he lost his head. But I did take some ideas to him. I actually took a very simple theorem. Um, I didn't put it into, uh, you know, terminology, proper terminology words. I mean, I was talking to kids. I mean, that's one of those things. The more simple a theorem's premise, the greater its applicability. I think that's Albert Einstein again. So if I use simple words and don't add a whole bunch of, you know, words that nobody else uses, then, well, it's more applicable across the board. And that is actually the, uh, it's like a mission statement for the APS, the American Physical Society, to, uh, they want to get more people involved. They want a broader view. Now, I don't know how it gets any broader than making something very applicable. Um, by making it as simple as possible. Actually, I kind of, I kind of threw a fit, um, you know, because I don't know a lot of terminology words, you know. Like I know there's a foyer, a waiting room. Uh, it's like a patio. It's like a lounge. It's like an entryway. It's like how many things can you call a front room? sitting in the waiting room ah, ah. but uh you know you don't need a thousand words for one thing i mean if you can explain something in simple words it can be better unless you know unless but um well albert einstein working at you know the patent office actually I don't know, that's where he was getting patents for making time a standard thing. And actually, Albert Einstein says something that it's pretty simple. You know, time is an illusion. Albeit a persistent illusion, it's an illusion. Now, I have never left the point in time as I know as the now. Like, whenever I was in the nows of yesterday, this now right here, whenever I think of the nows of tomorrow, all these points in time are connected. Now, if I go get a book from the now of yesterday, and it has never left the now either, and I could grab that book and hold it, now, then now is always connected. Um, 
you know, and that's just one of those simple things. You know, que no, that wasn't a question. And with the period, I can ask myself a question. I don't always need to get my answers from somebody else. Um, you know, and now we know, K, no, with the W, now. Um, but basically time, as we are in a dimensional, you know, three-dimensional space, um, a rhombus, it's the weirdest idea. You can look up the word rhombus, and there's actually a description of it. It's a three-dimensional cube that bends itself inside out. Now, whenever a paper or something you're told to uh, check the box, and it's just a square, and you listen to Bob, and he tells you to give thanks and praises for the moon and stars, and you look up and you see those are in spheres. Well, that's the most natural shape that gravity takes in three-dimensional space, as all things are connected. The singularity is still connected. One, two, three dimensions of space, like a Rubik's Cube. Now, the simplest way to check that out is, well, we need motion. As all motion through space requires change, well, yeah, that's basically what time is. Um, it is just a rate of change that we rate everything else by. You know, give it a minute or a minute. I mean, you can have, I don't know how many minute moments in a second, but, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Actually, whenever I took the ideas to uh, Douglas Singleton at Fresno State, um, the Higgs boson hadn't been discovered yet. And me and Douglas Singleton actually got into a conversation. Um, you know, I was explaining something, and it has to do with sound and how sound propagates. Um, basically, what I imagine sound is, is atoms and molecules are always in motion. Now, equal and opposite forces are supposed to cancel each other out. So if those energies cancel each other out or bounce off each other, there still should be some kind of friction, some kind, you know, if, if the thermals are staying about the same, that requires continued energy. Um, as thermal energy dissipates, all heat and thermal energy has UNRWA, you know, um, UNRWA, whatever it is, radiation, a certain amount of it, like even just the smallest bits of friction. So, um, and I know I'm just talking, but I got to go write this down. Um, but I also want to talk it out. So, the rules for the patent office. You cannot reverse engineer anything patent. And now, being Hawking explained in his over-the-counter book that you get from Barnes & Noble that string theory, the math for it, is reverse engineered to fit the theorem. And being, I got a theory to Douglas Singleton that ended up being entropic derivation of force equals mass times acceleration in circular motion. Um, I didn't name it. Entropy, you know, the amount of energy in the system is supposed to be unchanging. He actually has a work called Perpetual Mobile. Um, you know, it's pretty cool. It, I don't know if it, it reminds me of like a, you know, a kid's mobile from a crib and also a lunchbox. You know, it's basically the physics for, yeah, you know, the amount of energy in a box stays there unless it finds a way to escape um now that's perpetual mobile i mean it's the uh yeah it's just basically the physics for a lunchbox um you know once you get like space and you're not letting molecular motion get through the 
molecular motion that is in the box stays in the box. However, I'm sure the heat can still escape. But, but, well, so being, you know, the rules to patenting something explain there's no reverse engineering allowed. Um, Stephen Hawking explains string theory's math is reverse engineered. Um, at least his version. Now, I don't know who's got what going on where, but if they're using Stephen Hawking's string theory, then it's probably not patentable. Um, and that's just the rules of the patent office. Now, I did write a definition of gravity also. Um, actually, I did quite a few things. Um, I just started seeing things, you know, whenever I read that book on Einstein, I read it late. Um, well, my brain just kind of turned inside out. You know, I started seeing things new. Actually, I saw an idea for a clean energy process on the 18th. Now, on the 24th of October 2008, John McCain actually, during his presidential bid, he made a campaign promise that if somebody can make an electric car go twice as far on a single charge, they'd get a dollar from every man, woman, and child in the U.S. And I'm actually, too, that's, I'm good with that for me. But, you know, I also have other goals. I mean, I've been working on this for more than 11 years now. And I've noticed that there's a lot of stuff that the planet needs. You know, we're... Uh, living in times of global warming but nobody wants to deal with it um you know we're still selling gas um i won't talk about the political stuff uh we did have a double-headed turkey this past thanksgiving and hopefully we don't have another nightmare before christmas this year you know like that's all i've seen the last three years in a row i saw krampus come out selling coal I saw whatever I saw that Thanksgiving, but no nope, turkey was pardoned. And then I saw a two-headed turkey pop out this last Thanksgiving. And, uh, well, hopefully this year we have something to be thankful about. Um, so, I went to Denver. Actually, I went to, uh, I can't even remember the, can't even remember the name of the town. Um, it's right next to where Charles Schultz, you know, lived. They were actually, uh, at the crosswalks, there were the peanuts, you know, like, uh, Lucy and Chuck and, well, I like Pigpen. Yeah, Pigpen was on my first checks. Um, with his little snuggie, his warm little blanket, you know, like, dark energy. A big warm blanket that keeps us all moving and going you know like if there wasn't some kind of energy to patch or bridge where equal and opposites did you know yeah equal and opposites cancel each other out well or whenever say you push a rubbermaid trash can you know now Obviously, some of that energy has already escaped. So why does it pop right back to where it was? There's obviously energy there from somewhere making its way in for general relative standards to be maintained. Um, and actually, well, Douglas Singleton, I didn't know he did this. I actually just did this recently. Um, I got kind of sidetracked. I've been dealing with the law for a while. I've been, uh, yeah, I took my last, my last month of rent a little while back and tried to start a business. Actually, I tried to start two. I tried to start TDK, Talon, Dad, and Casey Tech. Um, you know, and basically the tech is, I wrote the definition of gravity. Um, it cannot be patented using string theory 
as far as I know, as long as it's, you know, well, Stephen Hawking's theory can't be done. Um, he's already admitted that that was already reverse engineered and it did not follow proper scientific method. Now, I wrote gravity, I don't know, I just did it. Like, I just saw the volume of a sphere, um, the most natural shape in the universe with gravity, the spheres. Um, I took an idea to Douglas, you know, when you put an object in the circular motion, you know, you just get it spinning or whatever, or going around something else, you know. Um, as all things are connected, it's still connected through gravity. But you can see the amount of energy right there in motion. But being an object in circular motion is both pulling itself apart and holding itself together through either chemical bonding or else gravity. It is, you know, having reverse gravitational forces as well as gravitational forces. And we know through physics that some objects that are actually heavier have actually less energy in them. They just have more motion. Therefore, their relative gravity is heavier. And uh, I thought that was pretty neat, you know. Um, I actually figured out something for Mercury the other day, too. But uh, that can that can wait. Actually, a guy, Douglas Singleton, you know, I took ideas to him, and the first thing I told him was, look, if there's, if the Higgs boson has no gravity, then it couldn't be in the universe. You know, E equals MC squared. Um, it's right there. E, energy, equals mass times speed of light squared. Now, they're both on the other side of what energy equals. So it's already defined. Um, everything in the universe, so far as I know, has to have some kind of mass for it to be in the universe. If there was an empty shell of something, well, kind of like the bubble in the recent Da Vinci thing, um, well, that even has mass. I mean, although it floats, or it just pops like our housing bubble. But, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking also explained that the math is there to support the physics. And, I don't know, the economy, you know, economics, the Nobel Prize for economics a couple years back was about the environment, about what we're supposed to be doing as adults we're not supposed to be acting like children. You know, we don't need to throw everything we use away. Um, you know, there's even a band named after that, the Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy. You know, like, I remember, I'm pretty sure everybody's told their kid, everybody that's raised a kid, throw your sippy cup or you throw your bottle one more time, you're not going to get another one. You're not going to get it back. And that's how we make it through life now. Um, it's kind of silly, you know, we're not supposed to get all OCD about stuff. Now, I do understand this whole COVID thing, although some of it is beyond me. Like, um, I've been taking the word COVID-19 and just drawing stuff out of it. And I've got a picture of Mr. Poopy Butthole. And I've got... One with Squidward. No, not Squidward, I'm sorry. Um, one with Plankton. Which, mind you, why does Plankton have an eye? It's a single cell organism. Um, that would have taken quite some time to actually evolve and to, oh wow, what is that? I feel something. Is that heat? Is that light? What is that? And, you know, like eventually that single cell organism kept splitting until, oh, that's what that is. You know? It could see the light. It could feel the heat. It could, I don't know, it just could. It just kept doing its thing. And uh, I think that's what we're supposed to do too.
Now, it's weird, the biggest animal on the planet, the, you know, um, the big, biggest Brahma of all the bulls is the blue well. That's a Brahma blue bull. Well, it's a Brahma blue bull. It's the, uh, a bother bull bull bull. All right, but, um, you know, there's two. As we know, liquid and fluid, um, you know, liquid is what? It's just fluid, you know? They're both made of the same stuff. It's just one is. They're both fluid. They both move and are malleable. They're not solids. Um, but... One is actually in the form of a fluid. So, I mean, one's actually in the form of a liquid, duh. And the other's in the form of a fluid. But they're both considered fluid because, you know, their motion is fluid. Um, so, you know, the big blue Brahma, blue bull, that hung out with uh, Paul Bunyan. Well, I don't know. Maybe he got here some way. Maybe he breathes the same thing that the... Uh, oh, he does breathe the same thing as the blue whale. They don't eat the same. Because the blue whale eats the smallest things on the, that we know, you know. They eat the single-celled organisms that we all potentially evolved from. And that is a much more flattering way for me to see it than to think that, oh, I just, it was a miracle. I mean, it is a miracle, but, you know, now we all make mistakes and we learn and we all don't make mistakes and we see the next thing that we have to do. And sometimes we get stuck in our ways so much that we do not see those things. We just pretend they're not real. Um, yeah. But, you know. So, I took uh, this idea. Well, actually, I wrote a couple papers. I never got past... Uh, they're called abstracts. I never actually got a work peer-reviewed, although my work has been peer-reviewed. I wrote a paper called Misty Morning. I took it to... Uh, wherever that place is, right next to, you know, where Charles Schultz lived. Um, and I did a presentation at a college, small college out there. It was actually pretty awesome. Though it was Halloween, I was just me. I was wearing a pink and orange tie-dye that me and my daughter made. And, uh, but at this thing, there was a penguin. There was Princess Leia. There was pirates and, you know, it was just... It reminded me of the Big Bang Theory, which is pretty freaking cool and cheesy all at the same time. Um, but I signed up for the wrong thing. I signed up as a teacher. Um, or, yeah, but that's fine. I learned. Teachers are always supposed to learn. And, you know, we're always life students no matter what. I mean, yeah, I was correct the first time me and Douglas talked about the Higgs boson. And then I took him an idea for entropic derivation that just needed to be tested, you know, had to uh, account for our friction and such. But, uh, you know, he did that. And then he went even further and he smashed it out of the park. He, uh, you know, he extended calculus to actually meet entropic derivation force equals mass times acceleration but I never got credit on my work but if you want to just open up a Rubik's Cube well you could also do it with geometry um, you know that's how a Rubik's Cube that's how the motion on a Rubik's Cube works is okay we have this three-dimensional thing but there's also motion let's see what's inside a pyramid there that's how you know, you get it to move. But the singularity always connected. Some of it in general relative three-dimensional space. Some of it didn't even have to make it. It can still just be connected. And as we need it, it's there. 
there's multiple ways this can happen you know if it doesn't change you know i'm told dark energy is about 75 percent you know potentially everything can shrink simultaneously at the same rate we use the universe's energy i mean everything is connected you know it it's not beyond possibility as well you know it would make uh i mean we can teleport but it would make time travel a bit hard but we'd just have to account for that and actually it wouldn't make it that hard being we'd just be teleporting through time well we'd have to use the atoms molecules particles stuff that was in that point in space and time then and there um and actually we're pretty damn close to that already you know we've already got teleportation has been proven um it just takes a lot of energy and there's you know a whole lot of data but um and that's where it gets a little crazy you know um now i've imagined the xenon process there's a gal that won a nobel prize in physics for stopping light at universal zero and i think it was xenon gas but if you stopped a beam of light you could code it and get a computer to run faster i mean as long as you code it you know and then you can even crunch that code onto another crunch beam of light i mean as long as there's you know a particle or two between each coded you know command process thought that we teach a computer then uh we got that oh and by the way now somebody said something about quantum computers saying that uh the planet doesn't care i read this in the news and this was bizarre to me um if the planet doesn't care because where we invest our money is you know how we make money is by investing in the things that aren't good for the planet well obviously that is programmer error the planet does care the person that wants to make money that programmed the computers maybe that's what they wanted to hear that the planet doesn't care um but i mean i'm part of the planet i'm not just on the planet i'm actually in the planet and you know for an ounce in for a pound but i don't know i'm in it i'm on it i'm on the earth i'm not over the rainbow um and the z always stays big which is pretty awesome so respect to the man with the oz and uh i don't know like if you're in it not on it not over the rainbow you're not just sitting atop the atmosphere then zion in for an ounce in for a pound in for a penny in for a pound something like that but um i mean we're here this is our job i mean i'm not waiting for anybody to turn their back on me and i'm not trying to turn my back on anyone either i'm just trying to do my job you know we got global warming we're dealing with um now everybody a lot of people say there's no such thing as global warming but i live in fresno california now we used to have a thing called valley fog here i used to actually be my grandma's eyes whenever she used to drive us around whenever i was a kid and uh you know during winter and stuff you couldn't even see you couldn't even hardly see the light right across the street like the street lights um you know like i used to have to be my grandma's eyes and uh but it's not just some movie from the 40s or 50s some black and white movie called the fog like there used to be a thing called valley fog right here in fresno i'm sure there's a lot of places where there used to be valley fog i mean if you look at just the paved roads you know paved paradise put up a parking lot we wiped out a whole sea of life you know insects bugs um gophers um i don't know what are those called hamburger oh groundhogs hamburger groundhogs burger ground ham hog i don't know it's just one of those things but you know the pavement absorbs the heat that alone is global warming 
if there's no water coming off it to cool things down and whatnot. Um, you know, like, it's just kind of a stale thing. But just the pavement alone adds heat. Now, every single car, you turn it on, the engine gets warm. You're also blowing a bunch of heat out the back. But, um, you know, I also took an idea to Denver. Now, this one I believe I titled Imagine a Dream of Love. You know, imagine um, John Lennon, you know, um, for being nice to a cow. You know, he got shot for being nice to a cow. Uh, dream, you know, that's uh, the dream. Martin Luther King Jr., a doctor and a reverend. Now, I don't know why anybody would get pissed off because he was a reverend and a doctor. Maybe, you know, they were just mad because he surpassed them and he still lived his own life, you know. I mean, I got to imagine his job had a lot of stress, a lot of things, you know. And people, people say different things about different people. Nobody's perfect. Um except for the people that are perfectly who they're supposed to be. And sometimes those people that surpass others and you don't think they should have, they come to an early end. Um, and it's pretty messed up. Now, imagine the dream of love. We all know who love is. Um, actually, Albert Einstein explains that love is the greatest teacher. And no matter what book I look in, you know, people, you know, what religious book, people bend words to their own want and will. And, uh, well, I mean, Bob's words, you could just hear him. You know, one love, one heart, you know. And uh, as far as I know, there is only one word synonymous with, you know, and it's love. And uh, love's important. Without it, you have a hard time finding understanding. Without it, you have a hard time understanding your responsibilities, our responsibilities. Um, you know, and our responsibilities are, well, we live on this planet. Um, and to identify an energy source, a clean energy source, such as a process that would harness dark energy or even one that would harness energy from black holes, um, dark matter, you know, like, I hear there's a process that, um, you know, somebody went and put elements together, and then whenever they take them apart, it jumps, and there's an added energy, and that would be, obviously, that would come from a black hole, as gravity connects all things, um, there are a great deal of force there. General relativity being our general standard norm maintained through dark energy, which appears as needed. And black holes, obviously, at the other end. Um, and, well, that also gets us to, you know, the big shh, atoms in the molecules it took two billion years that's a whole lot of time to have like one phone one battery pack that's got to last two billion years and a headphone from spongebob to be sitting there like flipping crabby patties so there's only one crab in the whole ocean and his daughter's a whale it reminds me of the oompa loompas from well why is there only one oomp where's the loompa and the puh and the doompity doos. But, uh, yeah. Oh, but Stephen Hawking's quote. I actually talked to a shrink about this. I, uh, I've been working on getting this idea into business, trying to get it, you know, properly funded and such. You know, as adults, we do have to understand that it is time to you know, break ourselves of our global addiction, be it the road, 
be it gas, be it us feeding our cars like, you know, we poop out in a colostomy bag, but that's where we feed our cars. And then it's also got another, you know, uh, gas hole. So there's two gas holes, but one's for exit and one's for entry. Um, I find it kind of funny because an elephant has two trunks, one in the front, one in the back. I went to the zoo. What did I see? I seen an elephant put its front trunk up another elephant's back trunk. And what did it do? It grabbed lunch. But what did it smell like? Ooh, pretty hot, I guess. But please don't grab my orbits because, yo, I mean, this is the only planet we got to live on. And, uh, you know, I'm not exactly a religious type dude. You know, like I said, a revelation and an enlightenment are the same thing. Now, whether you spell a Quran with a K or a Q, that book or those books end in the same way, a new understanding. And, uh, well, yeah, I think we need one. I mean, are we going to grow up? Are we going to deal with our stuff? Are we going to keep arguing with, uh, countries that, nope, we're just going to keep using gas? Nope, we don't even have microwaves. Um, dude, you have microwaves. You already have nuclear power. Just don't be assholes. Um, do you have x-ray machines over there? Yep, you do. Okay, what else do you got? Um, do you have radio waves? Okay, they're all radio waves. Okay, what else do you got? Everything. Everything that warms up even a little bit is moon raw radiation. And that's basically the simplest way I can explain it. Um... But, yeah. Okay. I talked for a while. Bye.